Behind me is the Kremlin, Red Square, and St. Basil's Cathedral, the heart of Moscow. In front of me down there is the Bolshaya Ardinka, the great road leading in from the south, along which the Tartars came when they invaded the country in the year 1240. These troops were part of the army of Batu Khan. He was Genghis Khan's grandson and heir to the western part of the vast Mongol Empire. Then and later, his soldiers would have trotted up this way in wave after wave on their small steppe ponies, with their bows and quivers slung across their backs after the raiding season had opened and there was tribute to be collected. In later centuries, the Tartar Mongolian administrators lived along this street. They intermarried and intermingled with the Russian princes, and in time developed a hybrid state whose influence is still felt in Russian governance to this day. My name is Ian Mitchell. I have been fascinated by Russia ever since I first visited the Soviet Union in 1977. Ten years ago, I came to live here, and since then I have made it my business to try to understand, in historical terms, how it is that Russia has come to be as it is. The Mongols were and are at the heart of that. Other invaders than the Mongols have tried to shift Russia from her historic path of development. Many of them came from Europe, but few had such a devastating impact or are so well remembered today as the Nazi onslaught in World War II, which washed up right here where I'm standing on the afternoon of the 5th of December 1941. This is an event which is memorialized in this monument here to the tank traps which helped to slow the German advance. In those days there was of course no IKEA, no Mega Mall and no Ashan hypermarket here. All the Germans would have seen were a few straggling wooden huts at the level crossing where the road to Leningrad met the railway line, as it still does today. The small scouting detachment that had driven the 10 miles down from the main German front line at Zeleningrad on that dark and overcast day were probing for the first signs of resistance. They found none at all, so they went back to report this startling fact. The Kremlin is only 15 miles south of here, the road to central Moscow seemed open. In fact, the Red Army was somewhere else, as the Germans were to discover in the early morning darkness on the very next day, when the great Soviet counterattack began. No armed German was to stand this close to the Soviet capital ever again. However, today, unarmed Germans are entirely welcome, as you can see from this sign here to Germanica the Volkswagen Center just a little bit further down the Leningrad Highway. It takes a certain kind of man with a certain reputation to alleviate the cash from a whole entire nation. Take my loose... Russia is a big country with a long history. This is a big subject and I'm going to write a long book about it. It's going to run to three volumes. Put very briefly, Volume 1 describes how the Grand Princedom of Muscovy was established along Mongol lines and with Mongol help. Volume 2 starts with Peter the Great and ends with Stalin. It explains why, in a rapidly modernizing world, the structure of Russian governance did not evolve with the rest of Europe. It may have gone from imperialistic czarism to international communism, but the relationship between the state and the people remained very much as it had been under the Grand Princes. Volume 3 will take the story from 1953 to the present and show how even in an environment of capitalism and consumerism that relationship has changed remarkably little. So what is that relationship? I call it an internal empire. At its simplest, that means there is no reciprocity between the rulers of the land and the people who live on it, who for all practical purposes have the status of a conquered people. They are compelled to provide their rulers with the means to ensure their continued subjection, with no realistic hope of changing that situation. The rulers do not feel they have any duty of care towards their subjects. They treat them as a resource whose liberty is tolerated only so far as it does not interfere with the state's own autonomous purposes. Information is restricted and public policy is a private matter for the rulers. The most important institutions of the state in Russia have always been those which defend it against its enemies, both external and, crucially, internal. 
Students of Norman England will recognize that description, as will anyone familiar with the history of the enslaved states of the American South before the Civil War. They too were internal empires. There have been many others in world history. China is arguably the most extreme example. Russia is not unusual in having gone through that experience. What is unusual in the context of the European cultural space is that it is still like that. That is what calls for an explanation, and that is what my book is about. Finally, let me make a point which springs directly from this continuity. The internal empire in Russia has lasted longer than any of its competitors in the West, with the arguable exception of Anglo-American law-based constitutionalism. That dates back to Magna Carta, which was sealed just 20 years before Batu Khan invaded Russia. In terms of continuity and staying power, the Russian system is not dissimilar to our own one in the English-speaking world. They both have 800 years of history behind them. The Russian internal empire has survived war, peace, victory, defeat, invasion, revolution, cultural upheaval, economic collapse, territorial fragmentation, and even the arrival of the internet. Like our own system, it is not going to go away anytime soon. That is why, if we all want to live in peace, we need to know how Russia has come to be as it is. That is why I'm writing my book about it. Party like corruption, disco seduction.